Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm very excited that we get to do these things. Um, well, right now it feels like a much more regular basis. This is exciting. So I want to welcome everybody, first of all, to our wellness webinar. This is our topic today is on gestational diabetes. Before we begin, just some housekeeping rules or information to share with you. We've automatically turned everyone's cameras and microphones off, but you do have the ability to unmute yourselves and show your cameras. We do ask that you wait until the end of the presentation, not to interrupt us in between, but there is a chat function here. So if you are watching along and you're going to forget forget to ask something you can put it in the chat feature and at the end of the webinar we'll review whatever we've collected there and then we can ask everybody um, if you have any questions or any comments you can open up your mics at that point at the end of the webinar and we'll uh, we'll go through questions and answers at that point the webinar is being recorded when you uh, arrive i think there is an announcement saying that it's being recorded so just as an fyi because at the end of this we will make sure we'll send the recording link out to anybody who registered but maybe wasn't able to attend or if you want to watch this again you can do that at a later date i do want to just also put in a content or a trigger warning about halfway through our webinar today we do talk about some maternal and fetal complications that could be some sensitive subject matters for anyone if you are feeling uncomfortable or you'd rather not listen to that portion of the program, you can obviously feel free to walk away from the computer or mute us and then return a few minutes later as we go into the, the uh, final third of the presentation. <clears throat> and lastly, as a general disclaimer, anytime we put on these webinars, any of these presentations, et cetera, they are for your general education purposes. So please be sure to consult with your primary care physician or whoever your specialty doctor is if you need any particular weapon, uh, webinar, any kind of medical advice. So hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. So let me go on to, bear with me one second as I click through here. Okay, there we go. So we'll start off with our introductions. First, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Dina D'Alessandro. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, also known as an RD or an RDN. I've been doing this for about five years now. I am based in New York City, but I also work out of New Jersey and on a virtual platform too. I'm an adjunct lecturer with CUNY, which is the City University of New York, Lehman College in the Bronx, New York City. And I uh, received my Master of Science in Nutrition there. I also teach undergrad and graduate nutrition courses there. And until we received our stay-at-home orders last year, I was also the on-site campus dietitian at the Student Health Center. I've also worked in a high-risk OBGYN office, a private practice, about for about four years up until about last year, which is why this topic in particular and this population are really near and dear to me. I also very much value the specialist role of a registered dietitian. And so you will hear more about what a dietitian can do during this presentation. I also work in community and corporate wellness settings as an independent contractor for programs like the CDC's National Diabetes Prevention Program. And I also like partnering up with and collaborating with a variety of healthcare professionals and providers in both my local areas in New York and New Jersey and also in the online platform. I provide on a very part-time basis, um, individual and some group counseling for those who've been recently diagnosed with or at risk for chronic diseases with a specialty in high-risk pregnancies and diabetes prevention and management. I'm looking in the future to hopefully get more involved in things like food and nutrition programs and policies to draw more attention to um, marginalized populations and health inequities, both in my local area of New York City down here on the Lower East Side, as well as hopefully nationwide and globally at some point too. I conduct social media wellness promotions, Instagram lives, Facebook lives, takeovers in hopes to disseminate information and clarify any misinformation when it comes to food and nutrition. And you can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet as Dish with Dina. I'm also a preceptor. I have a very fortunate role of working with a variety of dietetic interns across the country from a, a bunch of different programs, much like my dietetic intern here at Dulce, who is also my co-presenter and who did such a fantastic job in putting together all this information that you're seeing together today. So I will hand it off to you, Dulce, to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Dulce Velasquez and I am from Houston, Texas. 
I did my undergrad at the University of Houston and received my bachelor's in human nutrition and foods. I am now a wellness workdays dietetic intern, as Dina mentioned, and I am also pursuing a master's degree in nutrition at Simmons University. And I'm so happy to be here and thankful for Dina for taking me as an intern. And thank you all for joining us today to learn more about gestational diabetes. So let's get started. The objectives or takeaways of today's webinar include an intro to gestational diabetes, where we will discuss what exactly this status means for both mom and baby. We will understand the causes of gestational diabetes, learn about the risk factors that increase your likelihood of gestational diabetes, discuss the details of being screened for gestational diabetes, and lastly, we will go over the prevention and management of gestational diabetes. And within this topic, points that will also be discussed are complications that may arise, nutrition for GDM, physical activity recommendations, and postpartum management. Now, Dina, if you want to take it away. Yeah, so we have a poll, a very informal, anonymous poll we'd like to launch here. Give me one second. I'm trying to figure out how to do this because every time I do these things, they seem to be doing something different. There we go. Okay, I think I, think I have the poll up here. Do I have the poll? Hmm, 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 hmm. Of course, we will be having technical difficulties with my poll launching. It doesn't look like it's going in. Nope, doesn't look like it's going in. All right, so we'll skip the poll for now. We were going to find out from everybody some de demographic information. So actually, what I might ask you to do in the chat box right now, if you don't mind, because again, it was supposed to be anonymous, but if you want to, at the very least, share with us where you're watching from. Are you in the States? Are you on the East Coast? You know, you can put put your city and state if you want to. Um, we also wanted to get an idea of how familiar you might be with this topic. So if you feel like divulging in the chat in the chat box as well, whether you've ever been pregnant, know somebody who was pregnant, anyone who had gestational diabetes or suffered from complications from it, Again, since this is no longer an, an anonymous poll, feel free to answer or not answer any of those questions. So I'll give you a couple of minutes if you want a couple of uh, more, more seconds to go in there if you want to drop any information in there. And then I think the other question I wanted to find out too was uh, a couple of different things regarding food, nutrition, and physical activity. So I think what I might ask, since I don't have the poll launching, is as far as physical activity goes, right? General movement over the course of a week what we consider to be moderate intensity. So your breath is kind of getting up there, but you're not so belabored that you, um, you know, can't hold a conversation. We usually recommend about 150 minutes per week that comes up in later on in our slides. So in using that as a basis, could you enter into the chat feature about how many minutes per week per average week, I should say, do you get a physical activity in the moderate intensity level? So look at all seven days, and give me an idea of you know what how many minutes times days and what that ends up with so is it 30 minutes or less for an entire week is it 60 minutes or less for an entire week is it 150 minutes or more for an entire week and you can add that information in there too and then we'll check that out um in a sec i'm going to look through this right now as everybody's writing in like everybody's saying hello 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 hi everybody thank you thank you thank you okay watching from NYC, thank you. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Diagnosed with GDM, 60 minutes a day for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, and if anybody else wants to add that information in there, again, just your location where you might be watching this from. If you have any personal or related experience to gestational diabetes and pregnancy, and the last question had to do with physical activity. How many minutes on average per week do you get of moderate intensity physical activity? All right, Dulce, I'm gonna hand this back to you now. Did you know that diabetes has three main forms? Type one, which usually develops in childhood, type two, which is more of a lifestyle related condition and gestational diabetes, which is a leading complication in pregnancy. Now I must note that diabetes is also known as diabetes mellitus. So you may see it abbreviated as GDM throughout our slides. Now, gestational diabetes can be defined as a temporary form of diabetes that de develops in four to seven percent of pregnant women, typically developing after the 24th week of pregnancy and disappearing within six weeks after delivery. 
It also accounts for 88% of all cases of diabetes in pregnancy. It's characterized by insulin resistance brought on by hormonal changes to take, that take place during pregnancy, not to mention that the baby's main source of fuel is glucose. Excellent control of blood glucose levels throughout pregnancy can improve maternal and infant outcomes substantially. And we'll be talking about this further in our presentation. During pregnancy, most women experience insulin resistance to some extent. This is normal and a healthy response to pregnancy to help make glucose more available to the fetus. During the second or third trimester of pregnancy, metabolic alterations occur to meet maternal and fetal demands for energy and nutrients. These alterations include changes in both insulin secretion and glucose, amino acids or protein, and lipids or fat metabolism. Yet it must be highlighted that you can be perfectly healthy, super active, be a triathlon marathoner with no previous health problems, and still be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Sometimes there are risk factors for gestational diabetes that are linked to multiple genetic and environmental triggers. So, such factors include a history of abnormal glucose intolerance, previous troubles with pregnancy, a family history of diabetes, being over the age of 35, which is also known as advanced maternal age, and being of African American, Hispanic, Native American, or Pacific Islander descent not because of genetics, but because of health inequity of marginalized populations. Other risk factors include having excess or insufficient body fat for healthy maintenance of hormones, as well as participating in unhealthy diets, which we will define in upcoming slides, and having low physical activity levels. All pregnant women should be screened for a variety of risk factors when they are first going to their prenatal visit. And that can be as early as about eight weeks after their last menstrual period and tested for a glucose tolerance at weeks about 24 to 28 because that's usually around the second half of pregnancy after the placenta has fully formed. Although a practitioner might opt to test a little bit earlier if you already are in those higher risk categories based on the factors that we just mentioned. In your screening, you might hear the following terms which are all used to confirm positive results for gestational diabetes. And each of these has its own quote unquote normal range. We're not gonna go too much into specifics for most of those tests in this particular webinar, but we wanted to at least give you some insight into understanding what to expect. One of the tests you might hear about is called the hemoglobin A1C, also known as the A1C test or the HbA1C. It's a simple blood test that measures your average blood sugar uh, levels over the course of the last three months. You might also get a fasting plasma glucose test. That's another simple blood test that may also be performed alone or along with some other tests. And then the main one that you probably heard about is the initial glucose challenge. So these glucose tests are the ones we're going to go a little bit more into detail right now. So the first one is the initial glucose challenge test, usually non-fasting. You'll drink a syrupy glucose solution one hour later, you'll have a blood test to measure your blood sugar level. And then if those levels come back elevated or abnormal, then you'll go on to take the follow-up three hour glucose test. And the follow-up one that's called a glucose tolerance test, that's usually fasting. That one, uh, we do tend to tell people just be prepared. It's not the most pleasant drink on earth to take in. So you might have some tummy discomfort. And this test is similar to that initial one, except the solution is much sweeter, a lot more sugar in it, and your blood sugar will be tested every hour for three hours. That's a significant amount of time being spent in the doctor's office there. And that's to see if you are having a reaction to that straight shot of sugar, if your blood is spiking to the level of carbohydrates in that solution. So if at least two out of three of those blood sugar readings are higher than expected, you could be diagnosed with gestational diabetes, and you probably will. However, we usually like to say that the results can vary by clinic or by lab, and your diagnoses and treatments may also vary by doctor. So you can opt to get checked again if you want to 
go through that whole sloppy solution of sugary drink again, or you can discuss your options with another doctor, or you can ask to work with a registered dietitian as well if, that's, uh, if that ends up being the case. Now here is where I will just note there might be a content or trigger warning for anybody who feels a little sensitive to some of this conversation, but we do feel it's important to include information like this in our presentations because we believe in patient advocacy and informed consent. So if measures or prevention or management are not taken into consideration, serious or even sometimes deadly consequences might occur for both mom and child. So not everyone with a diagnosis understands how to manage their condition or the complications that might arise if they refuse or are denied appropriate health care. So gestational diabetes, especially poorly managed GDM, significantly increases the risk of the mother developing the following complications that you can see here on the slides during the, their pregnancy, but also after the birth of their baby too. So a few things I just wanted to elaborate on. Uh, in the next slide, in the slides to come, Dulce will also mention the issues with fetal uh, progression and fetal complications too. So in case there is a larger than gestational weight child being delivered, if the baby ends up taking in more than needed glucose, they can be quite large, 10 pounds or maybe even larger than that. If uh, this is not necessarily caught ahead of time, that can cause some vaginal tearing and pel pelvic floor damage, and also maybe uh, instead there will be a C-section delivery instead of vaginal birth. So again, if you were looking to uh, deliver your baby naturally, but then had complications because of GDM, that could be the option to go because obviously we wanna save both you and the child from any complications there. Later in life for, for the mom, there could be issues with developing type two diabetes or also having GDM in future pregnancies, which sometimes happen and sometimes doesn't, which I'll share a little bit more in the slides to come. I also want to elaborate here on the words hypertension and preeclampsia. So gestational hypertension is diagnosed when your blood pressure is higher than normal, but preeclampsia is that hypertension condition with also an increase of protein in the urine, which could be a sign of kidney damage. And if that's the case too, as you're coming towards the end of your uh, gestational weeks, you're getting ready to deliver, the doctors may decide to induce you to go into labor earlier to avoid any complications with high blood pressure that could lead to, um, unfortunately, maternal death in that way. So these are some of the extreme cases, and we're hoping that in sharing this information with you, as scary as it sounds, we can potentially uh, stop or minimize these complications by just getting ahead of the game here. As far as the fetal complications, so what potentially is happening in the womb is that the glucose in the mother's blood, so you have two different bloodstreams going on here. The, the glucose in the mother's blood is passing through the placenta into the fetal bloodstream, which is a normal process. But in the case of gestational diabetes, again, especially if it's not controlled well, and there's a lot of elevated issues going on, the mother's elevated blood glucose levels can then lead to fetal hyperglycemia, causing elevated blood glucose in the fetus as well. In more uh, complicated matters, then you can also see what's happening here. A lot of different conditions that potentially could take place both in utero and also after the baby is born. And as I mentioned too, that, that when the baby is too large for their size in a way internally, that's what's known as fetal macrosomia. So that's larger than we expect, which could then develop into having a C-section be done. But if the vaginal birth still takes place, the uh, possible result that could happen is what's called shoulder dystocia, where there's kind of like a dislocation of the child's um, shoulder that can cause some potentially even permanent nerve damage. So again, pushing the baby out when it's probably not really something to do and opting instead for a C-section might be your better choice there. Of course, in future years, having this issue of hyperglycemia in utero can also cause the child to develop some other issues down the line as well, in, in particular uh, type 2 diabetes too. So again, we know that this is some scary stuff, but we want just to make sure that you're aware of what's going on before you get into anything and or just you know asking the right questions when you do visit your doctor. So all of the things that are listed here are interrelated and the ultimate goal, really the primary goal with this condition is to decrease your insulin resistance. We wanna make sure that your blood cells can take up that insulin 
even prior to pregnancy if possible, but you could even implement these approaches throughout your pregnancy and still see results. So learning about even just the diagnosis of being pregnant, what it means to be pregnant, related complications or risk factors in relationship to the diagnosis of gestational diabetes, like what you're doing today is a great first step, but education alone might not be enough. So we do encourage you to, whoops, you do encourage you to meet with um, hopefully a registered dietitian, somebody who might be on staff would be great, or if they can refer you out to somebody who is a registered dietitian, even in preconception stages. Um, and especially if you have gestational diabetes, because dietitians are uniquely qualified to administer what is called medical nutrition therapy or MNT which has to do with food and nutrition modifications specifically related to your condition. So we will be able to help you with those things. We can also counsel you on how to make implementing those strategies a little bit easier and helping you stabilize your blood sugar levels through a realistic and achievable way through those food and nutrition modifications that I just mentioned. Because sometimes it's not just enough to be told like what you see on the screen here, you know, maintain a healthy weight, eat well, move around a little bit better. So it's helpful to have somebody there to guide you along the way to break down those barriers and help support you while you're making these modifications because it can be kind of frustrating to have to do something that you've never done before. I wanted to just share before I hand this off to Dulce with a, another story about when I was working at the OBGYN practice that I did see a lot of success. I kept track of over, oh gosh, I want to say probably close to a thousand people in about four years, um, most of whom at the high risk practice, most of them were had the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. So that's pretty much all I saw. And so we had a lot of success working with them in making some of these minor adjustments or sometimes major adjustments in their eating habits and their physical activity levels and hydration. And I was really, really grateful to be able to help them on that journey because ultimately um, at the end of the day and at the end of the pregnancy, you know, I really think that they learned a lot just in general about their own bodies and what, um, what changes they can make that were sustainable in that sense. So I'm gonna hand this off to Dulce now to go more into the guidance of that prevention. With all the previous possible complications mentioned before there are steps you can take to help prevent and manage those maternal and fetal complications. The mainstay of treatment, as Dina mentioned, is medical nutrition therapy administered by a registered dietitian that begins with attempts to normalize blood glucose levels with diet and exercise. The next step if needed or doctor recommended can be the use of oral medication known as metformin which is generally used for the management of blood glucose levels during gestational diabetes in the second half of pregnancy when diet and exercise aren't adequately controlling blood glucose levels. Further medication includes the use of insulin if previous attempts aren't working. There may be circumstances where your doctor would start your treatment plan with insulin while MNT is in place. This is between you and your doctor to further discuss. Glycemic monitoring is, uh, is also useful to maintain appropriate glucose levels and being able to monitor any spikes and take appropriate action. This is where finger sticking comes in, which is usually four times a day, fasting first thing in, in the morning, following by once after every me main meal eaten. Also, fetal monitoring, which is via sonograms, can share critical information that can also help determine if certain factors such as diet or insulin or any medication are useful to manage glucose levels. Fetal growth monitoring is critical because with unmanaged GDM, your baby can grow at a faster pace than expected, which as a result can cause several complications during, during and post-pregnancy for both mom and baby. But please take note that no two women with gestational diabetes share the same history, risk, needs, and response to treatment. There is no one size fits all approach or identical pregnancy experience. This is especially true when it comes to nutrition. Each dietary intake plan has to meet the individual needs of a pregnant woman with gestational diabetes. However, we do encourage general patterns that emphasize the following consuming whole, whole grain breads and cereals, vegetables and fruits, 
Eating minimally processed nutrient-dense foods, limiting intake of refined sugars, which can cause blood glucose spikes, eating more complex carbs, high fiber foods to help slow digestion, limit unsaturated fats like those found in fast foods or fried foods, but include those healthy fats like fish, nuts, and olive oil, as well as lean proteins. Eating three regular meals and snacks every day, and I must emphasize no skipping meals, which goes hand in hand with our final tip, which is eating carbs in a consistent manner throughout the day to help maintain healthy glucose levels throughout the day. The recommendation of three regular meals and snacks daily is further discussed because women's allotment of calories should generally be spread across three meals and several snacks, including a low carbs bedtime snack to help prevent nighttime hypoglycemia. Proportions of daily calorie intake generally assigned to meals and snacks are 10 to 20% for breakfast, 20 to 30% for lunch, 30 to 40% for dinner, and 30% for snacks. However, these are merely recommendations of how to distribute calories over the course of your day. This can be very individualized. For example, if you're a night shift worker or tend to be more active during the first part of the day, in which case a registered dietitian can help you create a meal plan and pattern that works for the best. Caloric levels for meal and snack plans are considered to be starting points and often require modifications after results of blood glucose whole monitoring tests are known. There is no one specific meal plan or pattern of calories from carbohydrates, protein, and fat that works best for blood glucose control and diabetes. The American Diabetes Association recommends that individuals with diabetes adhere to calorie distribution from the energy and nutrients that meet blood glucose and other goals of treatment as well. And this is where the plate method comes in. From what I've heard, pregnancy can be or become very stressful. And so the plate method is a simple, quick, stress-free way to make sure you can get enough non-starchy vegetables and lean proteins while limiting the amount of high carb foods and managing a normal glucose level. So you wanna start off with a nine inch dinner plate, which is about the length of a business envelope for reference. Then you want to fill half of your plate with non-starchy vegetables such as salad, green beans, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and carrots. Then you want to fill one quarter with lean proteins such as chicken, turkey, beans, tofu, or eggs. Lastly, fill one quarter with carby foods. And those foods that are higher in carbs include grains, starchy vegetables such as potatoes and peas, rice, pasta, beans, fruits like pears and apples. Then for your drink of choice, it's recommended to choose water or a low calorie drink such as unsweetened iced tea to go with your meal. In women with gestational diabetes, research has shown that insulin resistance and blood glucose levels are decreased by regular aerobic exercises such as just walking, jogging, biking, golfing, hiking, swimming, and strength exercises. Since exercise lowers blood glucose levels, care needs to be taken to monitor glucose levels before, during, and post uh, exercise and to adjust dietary intake and medications appropriately to guard against hypoglycemia. Physical activity can also help with managing a healthy weight, which can be very, which can be a very individualized goal and not just based on what the reference standards state. If you've been active, it's generally okay to stay active, although there are so certain forms of exercises like hot yoga, contact sports, scuba diving activities with a high risk of falling and extreme weightlifting that are not really recommended during pregnancy. If you've been active, you can definitely start during your pregnancy. However, before starting any form of physical activity, talk to your doctor first. Always a good guideline, no matter what. 
So what happens after you've gone through your pregnancy with this diagnosis? Well, research tells us that about 15% of women will, uh, with gestational diabetes will remain glucose intolerant postpartum, so after they've delivered the baby. And about 10 to 15% will develop type two diabetes within two to five years after they've given birth. But the good news is that most women who've managed their gestational diabetes with diet and exercise will not require monitoring of blood glucose levels after pregnancy. So to determine if they're in the clear, women who uh, will be tested again about six to 12 weeks postpartum. However, we do recommend that even if we have negative test results showing up, that you should still make sure that you're repeating your glucose test. Normally, that's just the similar H, uh, HbA1c, that hemoglobin A1c test we mentioned earlier. That's part of your normal annual physical exams anyway. So it's always a good thing to make sure you're checking in on that. Keep in mind, again, we can't say this enough, that each pregnancy is unique. So for example, in my experience in the high-risk OBGYN practice, we had some of our patients were diagnosed with GDM for their first and their third child, but not their second. Some only had GDM for their first and then no issues or diagnoses in any subsequent pregnancies. Some were able to manage their diagnosis with that medical nutrition therapy we mentioned of making sure that we're going through that plate method, but some unfortunately were not. As hard as they tried, they would have to go on to have some sort of uh, pharmaceuticals and but they still implemented that medical nutrition therapy anyway because it was helping them support their, their particular condition. So of course, I'm going to keep tooting the horn of the registered dietitian that ideally working with an RD during even preconception, like I said before, or early in your pregnancy, the first trimester or so on, can really be an opportunity to review and reflect upon wherever some lifestyle improvements might be able to be modified. And it can also help prepare you in advance in case a diagnosis of gestational diabetes does occur. So on that note, if you could just humor me for a bit as I thank you all for attending our presentation and especially I thank Dulce for putting together all this information. We really hope that you have found this to be both informational and educational. Before we go into our Q&A, I just want to share with you some things to help you decide on next steps or at least maybe pass this information along to anyone who you think might be appropriate for. So first of all, what we supply you with in these wellness webinars is the what of the diagnosis. So in this case, we gave you everything you need to know about gestational diabetes, but working with a dietitian, as I mentioned before, can help you with the how in breaking through some of those barriers and making things a little bit more realistic and a little bit less stressful as you implement some of these strategies. So I work in a very part-time way with my private practice. I don't have a ton of clients that I see on a weekly basis, but I do have some spots. So if you'd like to schedule an initial consultation with me just to see if we're a good fit, you can go onto my website, dishwithdina.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, click the request an appointment button, and then just follow the instructions there to find a, a time that might work best for you. I'm also happy to refer you out. So if we aren't a good fit or if things are a little bit outside of my scope because I don't work with every single condition, I'm happy to do, put you uh, in, in touch with somebody who is a colleague of mine or share with you some directories that you can look into that are uh, you know, kind of RD approved to help you meet your specialist needs in that case. The, uh, you can also keep an eye out for a lot more things like this. We're also putting together some online courses that involve like weekly learning modules. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about your own diagnosis on your own, we also have some tied in Facebook groups some private groups that we're working on as well and group coaching programs too, to help us be as efficient as possible with our time. And so keep an eye out after this presentation, you are now automatically included on our email list. You can always opt out if you want to, but you'll be part of those email blasts, newsletters, and of course, you can always 
check on social media where we do a lot of our promotions as well. So please consider following Dish with Dina if you are not already doing so. Specifically, I think more so on Instagram is where you'll always find me. Uh, we also do wellness webinars, workshops, both virtually and in person when it is safe to do so on multiple health and wellness topics, not just women's health. Some of them are free like this. Some of them are fused. And if you would like to partner or collaborate with us, please email me at info at Dish with Dina com or you can dm me on any of the social media platforms there we really love working with healthcare providers professionals uh, community members or even just doing speaking engagements or putting on wellness workshops like this one if you think there are others in your circle that can benefit from what we have to offer so i really hope that this isn't the last time we see each other now going on to the next slide here, just to share with you, in addition to the research and articles that we use to put this presentation together, we also added some uh, legit websites and resources. We don't want you Googling Dr. Google on any of this stuff. So this is hopefully going to give you some additional information if you so need it, like the American Diabetes Association and the Office on Women's Health. And lastly, as a reminder, all registrants, regardless if you could attend this in person or not, who attended our webinar today or couldn't make it, you will be receiving an anonymous post webinar survey link because that really does help us get some feedback to figure out if we should uh, work in some ways of improving future events. You'll also get a link to this recording and you will also get a freebie because we love giving things away for free. So keep an eye out for a diabetes friendly recipes handout in the email that's probably going to come before the end of this week if I get my act together. So keep an eye out for that. All right, so let's open this up for Q&A. Let me double check the chat box in here too. And I'll read through some of the comments and things, but if anybody does have a question related to anything that we just discussed, or if you have any general questions, feel free to raise your, your emoticon hand, which I believe you can do Right, you can do that in the chat feature too. I think you can do that. Okay, so let me take a look here. Watching from NYC. Oh, I already mentioned that for Liz. Thank you, Liz. Denny, no experience, but 60 to 120 minutes. Oh, Denny, hey, Denny. Three to four times a week. Good for you. Getting in that exercise. Wonderful. Callie's watching from California, someone who had GDM, moderate intensity physical activity based on, these are all the questions that we asked earlier in the webinar. So thank you. Watching from New Jersey. Uh, thanks, Pessy. Thank you, the success stories. Amazing how activity and nutrition makes such a difference to both mom and baby's health. Yep, exactly. It's really important. Again, you know, not everything works for everybody. We can't stress that enough. And like Dulce said too, you know, I remember working with people who were like, I'm a vegan CrossFitter. How did I get gestational diabetes? You just did. I don't know how to answer that. Sometimes it's just the, the name of the game or the nature of being pregnant can be the issue there. But working with a dietitian, understanding what your particular condition entails and being able to ask the proper questions to your healthcare provider really can help you, I think, um, manage that condition a little bit better. So even though you, you might be doing all the quote unquote right things, there might be some things that we can modify in there. Or if worse comes to worse, you might be placed on medicine in addition to some of those food and nutrition modifications too. Okay. Dulce. Oh, there we go. Pessy, go ahead. I see your hand up. You can, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, Dina. Hi. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was so informative. Thank you, my dear. Um, I just had a question. I thought it was so interesting what you mentioned about how some of the women had gestational diabetes during their first and third pregnancy, but not their second. Yeah. And I may have missed what you were saying when you said that, but um, was it because they were at a different weight or there was no rhyme or reason? No, it didn't look like there was a rhyme or reason because you would think too, right, that the funny thing, not the funny thing to, to them, I'm sure, but the funny thing was they got it the first child and then the second child, they didn't get it. And they were like, woohoo, I implemented all the strategies. So therefore I must be, this is what happens. Like, this is the result of me implementing all my strategies. And then for whatever reason, the third child shows up and it's off the charts again a little bit. So I don't, when I'm looking back at those 
anecdotal and practice-based stories or those cases that I can share with you, I really can't figure out what the difference was, uh, especially because they've implemented certain strategies that worked for them the first time around. So it really does feel a lot of times like very hit or miss, or it could also be based on, you know, now they're older, that maybe different things metabolically or hormonally are going on that we just don't really have the studies to, um, to pinpoint exactly in comparison to where that was two pregnancies ago. Right. So that could be, that could be a thing too. Like maybe they just have a more sluggish receptor or more sluggish pancreas at this point. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Absolutely. And I would love any stories that you have, any <laughs> stories that you want to stop, but just, yeah, just hearing about like your experience dealing with this issue. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. one of the things that Dulce mentioned in one of the slides about the in inadequate or excessive body fat, you know, this can't be spoken about enough. And I know a lot of people who are on here right now are studying nutrition as well. And you'll know that if you've worked with me ever, I really go off on a tangent when all we talk about is excessive body fat and high BMI. So what we've come to understand is there are certain issues surrounding even low body fat that do not help with supporting or maintaining a regular period and on the onset of your first menstrual period, or even sustaining a healthy pregnancy. So one of, um, I'm not going to go too into detail because it was a very sad case, but one person I worked with who she herself was just a very slight person. Like she was very tiny and she had been that her whole life, but her body fat percentage really is what I'm talking about here. Cause BMI could be whatever, but her body fat percentage, I think was around a 17%, which is slightly under, you know, healthy weight. If we're, if we're categorizing that in relationship to BMI. So what we've come to understand through research is usually about a 20% body fat is ideal, but more so a 24% body fat in order to sustain a healthy pregnancy and make sure all the hormones are running and you're getting your well, you know, prior to pregnancy, you're getting regular periods, but for some people, a 24% body fat could put them in a quote unquote overweight BMI category. So this is why I really like to um, advocate for the patient and educate the patient as well, that you're hearing sometimes from your doctor, step on the scale. This is your chart. This is how we're classifying you, but you're not really getting into the behind the scenes of what's going on in your body composition with all that stuff. And that might not even show up in your blood tests. So just because you have a 17% body fat, all of your blood tests might be fine. And you might be considered, you know, quote unquote underweight. But if you've always been that way, and what we know from growth charts and, you know, just general, uh, just general information when we're going to our annual visits, you know, as long as we're keeping like steady, no, there's nothing to worry about. It's only when we have these big jags up or down that could potentially cause some metabolic disruption or cause for concern. So in this particular patient's case, um, she unfortunately was not able to sustain the pregnancy and we really didn't know what to do about that. So she didn't have an issue with GDM in that case, but I just wanted to bring that up because it was body fat related that most times people will say you're too fat or you have too much fat on you, but sometimes you need that excess fat to be able to sustain your pregnancy and have healthy hormones. In the case of somebody who I did work with, and Pessy, I feel like I might've shared this with you because when you and I did the pre-diabetes discussion, I think this might've come up, but in her case, she had been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, did everything quote unquote right, right? Made sure she was keeping on track. I think we even had her doing carb counting, which we didn't go into detail in this webinar, but that's when you set aside a certain amount of grams per meal of carbohydrates, like don't go above, you know, 30 grams per meal or whatever the, the uh, situation is. And, uh, but her body just was working against her. I mean, she just kept finger pricking and coming up with these crazy numbers all the time. So just as a general guideline, fasting blood glucose for pregnancy, if you're doing finger sticks, it's usually about less than about 90 to 95 is like the ideal, right? Less than 90, no less than say 60. But if you're doing these finger sticks about 90 to 95 and her blood sugars in the fasting part was, were fine. Her postprandial, so the finger sticks she was doing one hour or even sometimes two hours after her meal were significantly higher than her goal, which I think was at, and for pregnant women, it's usually about 130 to 140. Again, all of this is very patient specific and doctor specific, depending on how 
uh, conservative or liberal your diagnosis treatment <clears throat> is going to be. So it depends on what your labs are when you get diagnosed and whether or not we think you can modify and manage your diet and your condition. She was at like 210 all the time. So you're talking about 140 is the goal. And you know, like maybe 161 or 152 every now and then you can look back and go, oh, you probably had a lot of rice that day or maybe you were eating on an empty stomach and your blood sugar spiked, but we couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. So she ended up, uh, I think she ended up being placed on insulin if I'm not mis mistaken. And, and a lot of people get really nervous about being placed on medicine because all medicines do cross the placental barrier. But again, the benefits outweigh the risks when it comes to maternal health. And we've also been taught that the uh, fetus is not a parasite. So we try to focus first on maternal health and management of the, of the mom's situation. And then unfortunately we do, uh, you know, utilize the, the fetus as like a secondary concern. So we wanna make sure everything's okay with the mom because ultimately if those blood sugar levels are off the charts and we can't help with diet or physical fitness or hydration, medicine is gonna be the only way to go. And, uh, and for, what, for what I remember, I think we were able to get her on point. However, she did end up with uh, POTS, I think it was, P-O-T, right, P-O-T-S, P-O-T-T-S, where like your body's allergic to itself and to the fetus. So she ended up with a lot of other complications too that caused her to have a very stressful pregnancy. But to have a team, right, that's really the point of a lot of our discussions too. No disrespect to the doctors out there, but they don't know everything. They're not specialists in everything. So your OBGYN people know the hormonal health and reproductive health, but they don't know nutrition. And so Pessy, I hope that those couple of I guess examples um, were interesting <laughs> to you. Yes. I love that. And also I'm so curious, did they measure body fat percentage at the OBGYN? Never. Oh yeah. Never. Yeah, never. I did. I did. I did. I uh -huh. had my little, my little, you know, handheld device, yeah. super oh, not awesome. accurate, but like it was, it was enough, but I would, I would take a look at that and add that into the chart just as, just as a guideline. No, they never did. They just, you know, height, weight, and that's it. Off you go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anyone else questions, comments, feedback? Hey, Maria, thanks for joining. Hi, thank you, thank you. I'm looking at the list of people that are here. Dulce, is there anything that you wanted to add that we didn't necessarily cover or that, uh, I don't know, just in general, if there's anything you wanted to throw in there? No, just okay. <laughs> thank you everybody for coming and listening. Yeah, much appreciated. So if nobody else has anything to add, we are going, I'm going to stop sharing this just to say goodbye to everybody. Oh, that's so funny. Here's the poll. <laughs> After the fact, it just came up. All right. I'm going to ignore that. I think that's because I was on Canva for my presentation. So when I went to launch the poll, it didn't come up as a, as a window, whatever technical difficulties. Now we've resolved. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Do keep an eye out. We try to do this we're trying to do this once a month now. Uh, spread the word. Keep in touch with us via social media as well. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Good to see you guys too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.